Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter number 1. And we will read from verse number 9. <clears throat> I'd like to read in Colossians and Ephesians and just consider a few thoughts uh, this morning. As Brother Dave mentioned, it will be uh, devotional as well as a bit uh, doctrinal, and hopefully we'll understand what Paul applies these things to practically even in our lives, leaving the Lord's Supper this morning. Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering, with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Now over to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> we'll begin here at verse number 7. Ephesians 4 and verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastor teachers. And the Lord will bless what we've read together. My thoughts this morning uh, are in line with some of our brethren who have uh, expressed their meditation. It is sometimes something that we don't think about much at the Lord's Supper. We can think of the devotion of a son to his father. We can think of a sacrifice for our, our benefit, a substitutionary sacrifice on the cross. We can think of the perfect life of the Lord Jesus as a man. But the Bible also has this expectancy that runs through the Old Testament, beginning right in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. A seed of a woman that will crush the serpent's head. An expectancy of a mighty victor who is coming, a conquering king. And that's what I'd like to speak on today, that the cross was not merely the altar where a devoted son offered himself. It was not merely, not only a substitute for our benefit. This was a king who went into the battlefield of Calvary and won a battle. And through meekness and defeat, he won the meat and crown, as we sometimes sing. Trod all his foes beneath his feet by being trodden down. And these two passages have express that. Paul, in both Ephesians 4 and Colossians 1, is talking about the victory of the cross. Paul does not look at the cross as a defeat. Paul does not look at the cross as a sad story. Paul looks at the cross as a mighty victory. He says in Ephesians chapter 4 here that he did descend into the lower parts of the earth, but now he has ascended far above all things, that he might fill all things. And then in Colossians chapter 1, Paul says that this is the great plan of God, that through this man, through Christ, who is the creator of all things, him coming down, he would be the firstborn from the dead. And a great plan is going to take place through what happened at the cross. A victory was won. And through this plan, all things 
whether in earth or in heaven, will be reconciled. A great victory has been accomplished. And he says that this person, Jesus Christ, will come to have the preeminence. Now, I just want to look at them <clears throat> kind of section by section here. First of all, in Ephesians chapter 4. Later on today, uh, Lord willing, we'll try to talk a little bit about how to study the Bible. One of the things that I think is important to do is to come to the Bible with your inquisitive mind, to, to ask questions of the text. And uh, I've asked a question here in Ephesians chapter 4, just at the logic of Paul. In a sense, it almost seems like a lapse in logic. He's talking about the Lord Jesus ascending back on high as a mighty conquering king, winning gifts for his church. And then he says this in verse 9. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first? Now, if I've understood that correctly, what Paul is saying is, for him to have said to ascend, for him to go up higher, it must be that he descended. Now, at first, it seems like a lapse in logic. I mean, we can ascend, we can go up higher without going lower. I could ascend to this uh, stage. I could ascend further to the roof. But Paul says, basically, his logic is, the psalm that this is quoted from, Ephesians 4, verse 8, for that to be true, that the psalm said he ascended, well, it must be true that he descended. Now, is that true? How can that be true? So I asked the question, is that, is that just a lapse in logic? Is he just saying something? But you see, there is one position. There is one position in the universe from which you cannot ascend higher. The throne of God. Did you ever see that in Ephesians 4, that that little, almost aside, what is it, but that he also descended? There's a little verse on the deity of the Lord Jesus. That there was one, pre-incarnate, who could not go higher. Even Lucifer, it says, doesn't it? I will ascend. I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. But there was one. He could not ascend. He could not go higher in status. As we've been reminded this morning, God of very God, the eternal Son, he could not ascend. So Paul says, for the psalm to say that he ascended, it must be true that he descended. And Paul says, in fact, it is true. And what a stoop it was. We're coming now to what we began this conference with on the Friday night. He was rich. What is the measure of that riches? He could not be richer. He could not be greater. He became poor. That's what it says here. The lowest parts of the earth. I'm not sure if Paul means anything specific in this. Just the extent of that humbling step. From the one who couldn't be higher to a position that couldn't be lower. He stoops so low. But what's the point of it here in Ephesians 4? The point is that he would win a battle in this sphere that was so low. He would uh, conquer the enemy. The seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. If, his, if verse, nine, the, verse 9a, he could not uh, ascend higher, that's pointing to his deity, descending to the lower parts of the earth, pointing to his humility, filling all things, that points to his, not only his victory, but his sufficiency. The practical point of Ephesians 4, as it's going to go on to say, is that this mighty victory means that we are totally, completely blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, Ephesians chapter 1. It means that there is no church, of course here in Ephesians, maybe the broader sense, but no local church that looks up to their head and says, there's something that we're lacking that you just haven't provided. No, look at, look at what it says, that he might fill all things. And then what, what it goes on to say, he gave some apostles, some prophets. The point is, this victory is so great. The one who is at the highest point in the universe, stooping to the lowest point, conquering death, being ascended, yes, died, 
rose again, and then ascended back into heaven, a man in glory. That means that for his body, the church, there is full sufficiency. We lack absolutely nothing, brothers and sisters. That's the practical point from Ephesians 4. We lack nothing. There is a sufficient head in heaven, a fountain head, where all blessing comes to us. We can look at him uh, in, in the context of Ephesians 4 and say, there is no lack, absolutely no lack with Christ. That's the practical point from his victory. Over to Colossians chapter 1. This point, the reason I read there in verse 9, is uh, it's a very interesting expression. Paul's prayer for these Colossians. He says that I would desire, I pray for you, that, and a desire that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, maybe there's even some people here at this conference who would want to know the, the will of God. I, I hope there are. Certainly hope there are. What does this mean? I, I desire that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will. And then that will, that, that, that knowledge would be channeled in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And the end result would be a worthy walk of the Lord. What does it look like? Well, it looks like what it says in the rest. Pleasing him, fruitful, increasing in personal knowledge of God, strengthened, patience, thankfulness. These are the marks of a life worthy of the Lord. But I think the connection now is not this kind of subjective understanding of his will. Paul is not saying, I want you to kind of figure out what the will of God is for your life. The job he wants you to work at, the person he wants you to marry, all vitally important things. I don't think that's what the will he's talking about here. When he says, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of his will, I think the reason it goes on to talk about the great plan of God is because that's the will that Paul is talking about. He is not talking about almost this kind of narcissistic idea, really, we have of the will of God. What's his will for me? No, God has a very clearly revealed will for Christ. God has a will for Christ, a great plan, and that's why I think it goes on to say he is the image of the invisible God. I don't think this kind of doxology just comes out of nowhere. I think Paul is saying there is somebody that God has determined. A phrase I guess we should use rather carefully. But God has determined this. That there is one man who will have the preeminent place. He is the firstborn of all creation. He made everything. Everything came to be because of him. Everything came to be for him. Every blade of grass. Every undiscovered galaxy was made for him. Your neighbors were made for him. So were mine. Made by him, for him, through him. He has created, or as creator, he has the preeminent place. Then he says he's also the preeminent one in the new creation. In the new creation, the head of the body, the church. That's you and I. The new creation. And he has come to beget, begot us unto a new birth. First Peter. Right? And we are his new creation. And he says, so this, this plan, verse 9, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of his will. It's not this idea, okay, I, I want to be filled with what he wants me to do tomorrow. No. I, I think it's, be, have yourself filled that God wants Christ, and God will have Christ, and God has determined Christ to have first place. That's the will of God. And Paul's prayer is, and I think it will be, brought out throughout the letter, here specifically in Colossians, there was false teaching that was dethroning Christ from having the first place. They were saying you have Christ, but you also need this kind of mystic, um, really, potion that you have to go through, and then you come into this state of fullness spiritually. And Paul's death blow to the whole thing is, in him dwells the fullness. And we are filled to the full in him. Paul's whole point in Colossians is you need nothing else but Christ. And so it will fit very nicely into the rest of his letter. But I think the will here is God's will for Christ. You know, brothers and sisters, the one we have come to remember this morning. God has determined he will have the first place in this universe. He will not be put prominent. He will not share the presidency with any president. He will not be in the United Nations 
as maybe the head and a number of people under him. He will be preeminent in this universe over all things. He has conquered a victory. And one of the great expectations of the church is for the crowning day that's coming by and by. We take the feast in remembrance of Calvary and in expectation for the day when he said, remember he said when he instituted the supper, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it again anew with you in my kingdom, in the kingdom of my Father. And so we take the feast in anticipation, expectation, for the day when he will come to have all things and be first in all things. That's what it means here to be preeminent. So then, practically, what does that mean for you and I, just as I sit down? I think the idea of being filled here is similar, I suppose, to the idea in Ephesians chapter 5, be filled with the Spirit. It's not that you can have more of the Spirit, you know that, nor is it that you get more of His will. You know His will. His will is that Jesus Christ has the first place. To be filled is to let that control you. To be filled with the Spirit is to let the Spirit control you. Seen then in those following relationships, right? Husbands and wives and children and parents and servants and masters. Here, to be filled with the knowledge of His will is to let this will control my life. Christ must have first place. That's God's will for Christ. Okay, can I take the job promotion? And Christ have first place. Can I make the move? And Christ have first place. Can I begin the relationship? And Christ have first place. You see, it's not a mystical thing. You don't sit there and pray, I wonder. No. If this doesn't give Christ first place, it's not God's will. Pretty plain and simple. Because God's will is Jesus Christ preeminent over all. And if he can't have first place, very simple, very simple uh, principle for Christian life. That's not God's will. Because God's will is for him to have first place. So it becomes really exceedingly, uncomfortably practical. Very practical in our lives. Someone was asking uh, not too long ago, is there a difference between somebody being prominent and preeminent? What do you think about that? Is there a difference between somebody being prominent and preeminent? You say, well, you have to define them. Yeah, I guess so. Prominent, I suppose, means important. Preeminent means it's the only thing that matters. First place. I feel like a hypocrite really saying this. You know, for most of us, he's just prominent. He's important. He'll get a certain corner. He'll get our Sundays, our midweek, certain carved out portion, hopefully, in our day. But then it's our will the rest of the way. He's important. But remember God's will for this one that we've come to remember, our Lord Jesus. Preeminent. Firstborn. Firstborn. A word that we maybe could explain, but please understand this. It means first. <laughs> it means first. God's will for Jesus Christ is to be first. To be all in all. And that will should control you and I our conversations, our practical choices, to not have him prominent, but preeminent. I, I heard a story of a man, he was, it connects to a little bit of the work I did just uh, a couple years ago. He uh, tried to take his own life, he was a believer, but he uh, tried to take his own life through medication, went through a very, very deep lapse of depression, came out of it, was sharing his testimony, actually a relation of David Gooding, if you know who that is. And this is what he said, coming out of it now on the other side. He said, I know why. I know why I struggled so much. I know why I got so depressed. 
He said Christ was prominent, not preeminent. And I know even for myself, and likely for you, if he's not first, don't be surprised if life gets difficult. Don't be surprised if things get depressing. Don't be surprised if every day feels like a defeat. But you see, if we have the victor in mind, first place, commander-in-chief, nothing else more important, we march to his will. Well, don't be surprised then if we live as victors in Jesus. The Lord bless his word.